Okay, we're now recording. There we go. Okay. And I'm I'm happy for you to take the screen share off and intermittently do it, whatever, Pete. Yeah, cool. Okay, just letting everybody in usually just takes a moment. Um, welcome everybody. Just checking everybody's uh, got their cameras off and uh, not going to be video uh, videoing your lounge rooms this evening. So welcome everyone. I um, just got a couple of stragglers, a couple of familiar faces. Uh, Andrew Date, welcome. Uh, also Stuart Williams and Tim Boyle, welcome guys. Good to have you on board tonight. Just going to have a Really good chat with Kate Bakos today. So just letting a couple more people in, uh, a couple of late arrivals, and then we can get going. Hi, Andrew, on the chat box. So uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. So we've got up to an hour. We might not use the whole hour, but um, we've got the chat box um, you'll see on your screen. So if you've got any questions for Kate as we go, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box. I'll just uh, type in a message here. So you can answer any questions and we'll either cover them as we go along or if we don't cover them, we'll try and pick them up at the end. Uh, we're also recording this so we can send you a video. And if you also want access to the slides, I'm sure Kate would be happy to send them across. So just um, get in contact with us at the end. So I think everybody's now in. So um, I'll just get ready there. OK, right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, thrilled to say today uh, I'm joined by Kate Bakos, industry leader. Um, so just by way of introduction, I'm Pete Wardgen from Buyers Buyers. I'm a buyers agent of uh, not quite as long as Kate, about 11 years um, for, for me. And uh, just got a few more people to allow in to the room. One second, just another five late entrants. Welcome everyone. Uh, so Kate, uh, well, I always say yeah, I should need no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. So Kate is the president of REBA, the Real Estate Buyers Agency Association. Uh, that's a, a uh, well, Kate will actually explain what the mission of REBA is, but Kate is also the founder of Kate Bakos Property, a leading buyers agency across Melbourne and Victoria. So welcome, Kate. Uh, we're thrilled to have you today. Thrill is mine, Kate. That was a very generous intro. Thank you. And uh, Kate has actually got a uh, very uh, generously prepared a slide deck for us. Um, so we're going to look, in particular, so we're going to look at what's happening in Melbourne and Victoria. Quite a unique circumstance this year because we've actually had uh, some very restrictive measures put in place uh, that have essentially killed the number of transactions taking place at the moment. We've got a lot of pent up demand and some very cheap money, which people haven't yet have the opportunity to you. So really looking forward to getting your view on uh, what's happening on the ground, Kate, or what's not happening and what you expect yeah. to see happening next year and beyond. Uh, but let's start with a bit of an intro then, uh, just to give um, those who may not be familiar, just a bit of a, a background on yourself, how you uh, came to be a buyer's agent and set up Kate Bakos Property and then become the REBA president. Um, and also just a bit of background about yourself in general. Okay, well, it's a, it's a bit of a patchwork quilt CV when we look back um, beyond 10 years. So I started off life as a chemist. I was an industrial chemist, so I, I wasn't working in a white suit in a pharmacy. I was actually working um, with air sensitive technology, which means if, if it touched the air, it blew up. And that was quite a lonely um, outlook for me because you're working either in a bunker or in a bench by yourself so that you don't take anyone else out um, and I, I wasn't a passionate chemist I guess I fell into it and studied science so you know the discipline behind me is um, an honours degree in chemistry and there was lots of analysis involved throughout my my degree and I just couldn't really find my groove post that I, I went to ICI as a graduate chemist and worked in corporate and people were lovely, but it still wasn't me. And I always had a fascination for property. I was a property investor at that stage. And I even remember my, my honours um, professor saying, you've spent too much time looking at auction results and you haven't spent enough time in the lab. So there was always 
likely going to be, you know, a chance that property would pop back up. Uh, anyway, I, I made the break in 2003 and went into real estate and I, I stepped out of corporate life and into a sales office in Sandringham and I learned a lot. I learned how to swim really fast like a little fish in a shark bath and I don't say that with disrespect but it's a different game and it's a survival game and you've got so much to learn and as a, a young um, real estate agent I needed to to get a grip on, on being confident, being able to talk to people, being able to take the reins and, and guide vendors through the sales process uh, and, and work seven days a week. It was very, very hard. And you really are on your own. You get a, a desk and a phone and, and that's about it. And there were elements of that job that I found really gruelling. And then there were elements that I absolutely loved. And I knew then that working with buyers and working with investors and talking to people about the performance of property and researching property was, was where I wanted to be. And I, I glued the pieces together well enough to know that there was a job out there for me and it was a buyer's agent. But it was a very difficult industry to break into back then. And when my daughter was on the way, I, I took a sideways step and did mortgage broking for four and a half years. And that was difficult and it was a great apprenticeship. I, I actually learnt what banks like, what they hate, how they assess deals, uh, all about tax deductibility, uh, loan structuring, everything that I needed to know about being a successful investor and a good buyer's agent came ready packaged in that four years worth of, um, of hard learning. Anyway, I missed real estate terribly and my daughter was um, getting towards kid, kinder and I, I thought I've got to do this. So I, I took a role as a director in a business that a, a few people might know. I've, I've worked at Empower Wealth and set up the property um, division there and had some really good years. But in 2014, it was my turn and my time to go out on my own. And I've, I've got a team with me now and um, the rest is history. So I've put together, I guess, my, my passion for property, my analytical skills. Um, I love customer service and I think that comes through loud, loud and clear with everything that I do, but also understanding numbers and loan structuring and what banks love and hate um, makes for a really well-rounded advocate I think so I, I get up every day and even when I know I've got a big or a tough day in front of me I genuinely pinch myself and think I've got the best job in the world so I, I did find McGrove it just took a little while. I think you've probably answered my next question already then Kate because I, <laughs> one of the things that has struck me about you over the years is that I don't think I know anybody who's as driven in business or as a buyer's agent as you are, is that simply because it's kind of blurring the lines between what, what you're passionate about um, and your work? So it's, it's kind yeah. of just comes naturally to you? Because uh, yeah. I'm just thinking from my own personal experience, I, I think being a chartered accountant originally, like more of a, you know, I was an auditor, you know, it's not a, uh, yeah. it's not a, not typically a customer facing uh, career in the same way. And I, I just found through my work as a buyer's agent, um, I wasn't bad at it, but it's just, um, yeah, I never got the same uh, le level of interaction with people or uh, even just uh, the basics of negotiation and working through uh, managing all the different people. I, I found it quite draining in some ways, um, <laughs> but like you, you just seem to thrive on it. it. Is, that, is that simply because yeah. you've found your, you've found your calling? Yeah, yeah, I'm fortunate. I'm really fortunate. You know, lots of people don't find that in a lifetime and I've got the perfect job. And when people talk about growing my business or scaling it or what will I do in 10 years' time? Sorry, I've got a cat that's saying good day. Um, <laughs> I, I always think to myself, I don't actually want to change anything. I, I love what I do. I've got a great team, I've got the right boutique size business. If I could do this until I'm 80, then, you know, <laughs> that might just happen. I, I genuinely thrive on it and I'm very fortunate. I've got, um, you know, my, my husband looks after the house and, and home and all the rest of that. So, you know, in, in fairness to him, I don't have to do too much else. And, you know, a lot of, lot of women, career women, are juggling all kinds of things. In fact, a lot of career people, but I do feel like I've been very fortunate. So um, I think... Um Let's, uh, well, thanks for, for the intro, first and foremost. Um, I'm interested that you're, um, that you asked that question 
No, because I, I do feel disciplined and I write my blog every Sunday, but this is coming from a guy that writes a daily blog. Ah, uh, yeah, me too. I don't, need to, <laughs> I don't need to speak to anybody to write a blog. That's the difference. <laughs> oh, it's, got uh, it. Okay. In fact, if anything, it gets, gets me away from the wife and kids. So it's, uh, <laughs> I find it quite cathartic. But uh, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I just, um, well, one thing I can safely say is I won't be doing buyer's agency work when I'm 80. So uh, I think that probably. <laughs> says a bit about uh, our respective skill sets. So, so just um, for the for the, uh, the listeners stroke viewers, uh, so you don't only offer buyers agency services in Melbourne, you also cover uh, what, Bendigo, Ballarat, Geelong, those kind of areas. So you go a bit yeah, regional as well. I do, yes. And I've, I've taken on the regions in piecemeal. I've, I've learnt the regions each time I've stepped into them. It's not just something that for me, I don't think you can just wake up and say tomorrow I'm going to go to Echuca. I think you need to have a really firm idea of why you're going there, what's driving it, what, what are the, the fundamentals. And then you've got to get to know the area, the agents, the property managers, the good streets, the bad streets, what the locals like, what the tenants want. And it takes a while. You know, I, I did a lot of reconnaissance trips to Ballarat before I said, yep, let's do this. Geelong, I was already very familiar with. I had family in Geelong and grew up down on the peninsula and we were over the other side all the time. So it, it was not as hard to learn. But yeah, it, it does take a lot of dedication to, to be able to say I'm intimately familiar with a region and I know all of the agents, I know how they roll, I know the good streets. It, it's a passion though. Yeah, I can well, well empathise because I actually moved from Sydney to uh, Brisbane and doing buyer's agency work in a new city when you don't know the agents, the suburbs, and moving into state. I mean, you've actually got uh, different legal issues, uh, mm. completely different uh, buying process, in fact, and settlement terms. Uh, but just the whole thing is very different. But it, but even then, going regional, um, you know, people have different ways of listing properties in regions from the city sometimes you know different price guides there's a lot of stuff that you, that oh, level of nuance you can't you can't just pick it up in a few months it, it takes years yeah. of practice yeah very true yeah so i um i've got some big picture questions to come on to in terms of demographics and the tree change phenomenon and all that stuff and and even uh, some of your uh, uh, sort of gold nuggets of advice for next year but I suppose um, first and foremost for, for Melbourne and Victoria I mean there's just some real logistical questions about what you can and can't do at the moment um, I don't know yes. actually looking at the uh, we've got a huge turnout by the way Kate you've uh, drawn the crowds today so thank Aww, you. Thanks everyone. Um, but looking at uh, the people that have joined today I, I can actually see some of them are not actually based in Victoria so can you tell us a bit about what is actually happening in terms of, yep. and uh, you're not allowed to use swear words, uh, unless it's <laughs> a but uh, I'll keep it tame. so what, what is actually happening in terms of the restrictive measures and particularly how does that impact real estate? Because presumably you guys are not advocates of buying sight unseen. So therefore there's some real logistical challenges for you. Yeah, there are. So what you see, this, this is all I've been able to do so far for seven weeks. Um, we've literally been grounded to our living rooms and you know, that, that was a difficult thing for me to get my head around because I felt like I was infiltrating my family space for a while there. I used to just go at seven and come home at seven and they'd be excited to see me. And now I'm here making noise all day. But we, we can't purchase, we can't do purchase inspections. I won't buy sight unseen. So if anyone has fanciful ideas of looking at a video, the answer is no, find someone else to help you. Uh, what we can do is I've got a, a buyer's agent in my team who lives in Geelong. And that has been um, a little bit life-changing for a couple of clients because she's been able to assist there and um, FaceTime a video on and show me exactly what's going on as well. But realistically, that's only been a couple of clients that have been the beneficiary of that. Outside of that, we've been working on special projects, doing some um, analysis. I've been looking at demographic data. We've been sharpening our systems and talking to everyone, literally telling people, you know, what, what's going on as it unfolds. But at this stage, the only time I can get in my car and go out and do anything work related is with a work permit beside me when I'm doing a final inspection. And that has to be on my own with the agent standing outside. 
So a, a purchaser has a legal right to have a pre-settlement inspection about a week prior to settling and they can either send me or go themselves and, and that's, that's the end of it. I haven't got uh, any other activity that I can really partake in other than, you know, ranting and raving and getting my face on Channel 9 and saying it's not fair but outside of that we've all just really been supporting each other and keeping our clients up to date and counting our, our 14 day new case average. Yeah, so the, the number one question everyone always asks me is what's happening to prices? Now, I guess it's different around the country. Um, for example, in Brisbane, prices have barely budged a great deal at all. Uh, Melbourne, uh, certainly at the headline level, people are saying Melbourne's got the, the biggest price drops, but presumably that's based on a very thin number of transactions. And certainly yeah. one of the things we've seen in other parts of the country is that maybe the, the upper quartile or the premium market has seen a bigger impact in terms of percentage move just because well I guess the, the, the confidence issue whereas it may be at the lower end uh, price is more supported by the interest rate cuts is, is that something you've seen in Melbourne and Victoria? Yeah is it? it is I've got some data on hand I'll just put this up you know everybody wanted to know about this 30% downturn that we saw in the reports and it was just a, a big media beat up it was some clickbait and the reality is this is an RP or a core logic report and you can see what's going on there. Yes, Melbourne's had, um, had a dip, but overall, when we, we look at uh, what Melbourne's done year on year, uh, we've still, if we, if we track back a year ago, we're still up 5.9%, which is, you know, not, not in the headlines at all. If we segment the data, um, we've had price drops in the bottom quartile of 1.9% um, in the last, I better get this right, I think it's the last quarter. And we've had price drops in the top quartile of 7%. So yes, the, the top quartile has been um, you know, more, more vulnerable and that's what you would expect because not everyone's walking around with $3 million in their pocket, but we've still got a healthy appetite for purchasing and the lower end properties are still attracting buyers, whether they're incentivised first home buyers, which I'll, I'll go into chat about, or whether it's investors who have jumped enough hoops and they've got their pre-approval there and they're wanting to do something. Uh, what I will share is a chart that I made up. And this tells the story of what happened when COVID first hit. And that was our biggest shake up. And dare I say it, I might be wrong and I'm prepared to be proven wrong, but I don't think we're going to see price falls in Melbourne of this magnitude again. And even then, I would say that they were um, not dramatic. They, they were reactionary, but I'll, I'll talk through what this is. Um, this is the, the COVID case numbers when COVID first hit our shores and everyone was talking about flattening the curve and then you can see where it actually is flattening. And if we look at the dates, it might be hard for everyone to see, but this was straddling the end of March and the beginning of April. And, and literally, I'm talking about a two and a half, three week window here. I'm not talking about an extensive time frame. We're getting used to things moving pretty fast in Melbourne. <laughs> After last year, we just, we can never really um, tell the time with property. So I remember when COVID first hit, we had the pandemic declared on the 13th. I was bidding on the 14th in the inner west on a beautiful Californian bungalow and I, I had, done all of my pre-auction check-ins with the agent and there were, there were four of us, so three others in the game. And I had buyers that wanted it. They'd set a budget accordingly. And of course, on, on Friday, the pandemic was declared. On Friday night, they wanted to hook up. They said, Kate, I still want the property, but we're, we're quite nervous and we're going to downgrade our, our top end um, bid. And I said, that's okay. I totally understand. No one knows where this thing's going. At that stage, we we're all kind of shrugging our shoulders and elbow bumping each other. Anyway, the property passed in to me and that was telling because I was meant to have three key competitors and they were there, but we were all feeling it. And I thought, yeah, okay, if four people have reacted to this, there's more to come. Anyway, I, I decided to track this once we got to, to the end of the chart. I looked back at it and thought, interesting. So as the case numbers started to increase, uh, you can see the first acquisition I had, that's a 5% discount off my appraised value. So I just do comparable sales appraisal, try and think like a valuer and, um, and, and pick the comparable sales. As the curve started to steepen, I was getting 10, roughly 10% 10 uh, discounting. 
And as it started to look a little better and we saw the likes of Christopher Joy talking about, you know, when we could see the, the curve flattening and, and then we were getting some headlines about how well Australia was pulling through this or looking to, to pull through it, things started to feel better and the 5% discounting started again. And by the time we got through Easter, I was paying normal price tags for properties again. The, the discounting had finished. So that window of opportunity, I only had a handful of clients take advantage of that and they were terrified. But um, it just goes to show when the curve was at its steepest and fear was at its highest, that was when the discounting was at its best. And that's, that's human behaviour. Yeah, well, I guess has, just, just from an anecdotal point of view, we had through March and April... In Brisbane, we had a number of investors looking to buy a property, pre-approved, ready to buy. And then just through that exact same period, uh, we had a number of people just email us and say, look, uh, still thinking of buying, but can we just put the search on hold until uh, things are a bit clearer, essentially? Yeah. And we had must have had three or four people do exactly the same. Now, Queensland had very few cases. and uh, Things got back to normal, maybe a little bit quicker, potentially, but... Uh, certainly for that two month period, we had the same level of uncertainty, uh, despite there being very few cases of COVID. I, I think people were just worried about potential impacts to employment and, you know, just, you know, where things might be headed. But yeah, very similar, uh, very similar trends, I guess. There was, there was more potential to negotiate for a while, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of blown over. And certainly stock levels are just so low. Uh, particularly for houses in the suburbs, that the, there is just no prospect of prices dropping sharply because if something good comes up, it just seems to sell, um, you know, almost within a week quite often. And, and in some cases, the first open home has a large number of groups. So I, I assume stock levels in Melbourne, are you seeing similar things? Yeah, we, we certainly are. Um, this chart speaks volumes about what's going on around the place but we leading into this before we went into lockdown our stock levels were getting really grim and unfortunately that's because vendors are reading what's in the headlines but the vendors aren't going to auctions every weekend and and feeling what's going on at the coalface it's buyers that feel the coalface and vendors read the news you'll get the occasional vendor that will feel the coalface but not very many unless they've got agents in the ear saying it's going crazy and of course you and I have chatted about this, Pete, you get your data delays. So by the time we see CoreLogic putting out a report, it's, it's often quite old. And if we are seeing some energy with buyers in the market and we're seeing an opportunity for vendors to jump in and, and get some exciting sales results, that's not translating immediately in the news. They're still seeing fear mongering or, or you know, terrible outlooks. So you see vendors holding back and you see buyers saying, this is terrible, there's no stock, we'll pay more to get the right property. And of course, we started to see um, some, some peaky prices again in certain segments before we had a reinfection and went into stage four lockdown. It got very, very competitive and our listing volumes were, were awful and lower than last year, and last year was lo lower than the year before. So we, we really have had a tough time with listings. And in reality, it's underpinned um, price falls. We haven't had the price falls that we could have had, had we had vendors flooding the market. So question there to cover off from Tim there. So could you just differ, explain for us there the difference between new listings and total listings? So does the total figure that incorporates all of the stock that's on the market, including stuff that's been listed for two years. Is that yeah. and the, stu yep. the stuff on the it's left is what's sale. actually coming to market? That's right, new listings. So uh, if it's measuring it weekly or monthly, that's how many new properties are, are hitting the search engines. So and if I'm reading that chart correctly, then there was, a, there was a rebound in confidence in May, June, July, but new listings yes. are now down again, presumably because in Melbourne and Victoria, it's logistically almost impossible for people to get properties listed to market. Is that right? Yeah, there's two reasons for that. The first is the obvious one. We can't list. Uh, the second is that people actually are listing, but they're not putting it online because if you've got tough restrictions and you're not wanting every, you know, sticky nose neighbor coming through your property, you won't put a scattergun 
ad up online and pay a couple of thousand dollars to do it, you'll actually get an agent that's willing to make a few phone calls and have a look in their black book of buyers and pre-qualify the buyers and get them through because you're getting one at a time at best or really tight groups of buyers through and you've, you've got only X number of chances in a day to attract the right buyer. So you're reliant on the agent to, to get that right. And we've seen uh, a, a really notable decrease in online listings and an increase in off markets, which are really at the moment pre-markets. They're vendors that are prepared to sell their property and probably had the desire to do so this year, but they're saying, look, I'm, I'm not paying a couple of thousand dollars to go onto a search engine. I'll, I'll list with you. I'll get the photos done. I'll pay for, you know, glossy brochures and floor plans, but I'm not paying for online advertising. And that, that's what we're seeing translate. So Kate, you're the president of Reba and I know Reba's mission is to promote the benefits of buyer's agency as a yeah. sector and as an industry. Now, I'll give you a, a Dorothy Dixer question here, but presumably where properties are not being listed online as a first port of call, presumably that's where you as a buyer's agent has um, can steal an edge on most buyers in the market by getting first, yes. first look or first refusal on some of that stock. Is that a fair point? Yeah, very much so. Agents know that we have qualified buyers ready to go. Um, me for one, when I sign someone on and start searching, I've seen their pre-approval. I don't want to go out searching until they are in a position where they can bid with confidence. And we're, we're an auction capital, so there's no subject to finance, um, you know, excitement for me. That, that's not, not a great way to, to negotiate or, or to even try bidding because it, it generally will, you know, not work out for you. You've got to be in a position where you can bid un unconditionally or you can put in a strong um, negotiation and, and not have to fall back on a finance clause. It does happen, but it, it's rare and you'll always have the advantage if you've got a, a full pre-approval that's been credit assessed and you know what you're doing. Yeah, totally. So the agents know that. So they'll come to us because they know that our buyers are clear on what they want. They're not indecisive. They're not likely to cool off or change their mind. Uh, we'll do it properly. We'll execute contracts thoroughly. It's, it's actually less hard work for an agent when a, when a buyer's agent has the buyer prepped, ready, you know, emotionally, psychologi psychologically, financially, they know that we're probably more representative of, of a sure thing. And in an environment like this, the agents don't want to be mucking around with calling off or buyers getting cold feet. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I've got a real big picture question for you. So I, this is partly anecdotal. I've spoken to clients this year and they're on the Mornington Peninsula or they're in the Blue Mountains or they're in the hinterland or you know all over the, the place but not necessarily in the cbds of the capital cities now clearly there's an element of rational tree change going on people are saying mm -hmm. well you know there's restrictive measures they're getting out into the regions a lot of people have decided they they will just live regionally um so it's a two-part question really firstly are you seeing that um in victoria and um, certainly I've seen in rental vacancy figures, you know, Melbourne's CBD is through the roof of vacancies, Sydney the same. But then I, I look at trying to, if you're trying to rent a place, for example, I don't know, Sanctuary Cove or Gold Coast or Noosa, you know, the rentals are just coming up and being snapped up same day. So the, clearly there's a tree change thing happening. The, my second part of the question though is, if we were having this conversation in three to five years time, do you think, um, any of that will be permanent? Do you think people will go back to normal next year? Or do you think we'll have some kind of a hybrid where people work from home more often, but maybe still have a city connection, uh, more Zoom meetings and working from home? So I guess I'm really mm. interested to hear, A, what you think is happening this year, but B, what do you see over the medium to longer term? It's a great question. Uh, we've been seeing an attraction to tree change and sea change for a little while. And before COVID, I was always chatting about the parallel between Sydney and Melbourne when we look at, at the, the central coast and Wollongong and Newcastle, and then consider Geelong, Bendigo, Ballarat. And I've always said if Sydney has done it and we've seen a strong uptake in those regions, it's quite probable for all of those same 
reasons, the drivers that were behind the, the Sydney change, that the same could happen for Melbourne. And with, you know, commuting distances being shortened and flexibility and working from home arrangements, upgraded tech, NBN flowing throughout just about everywhere, um, we've, we've definitely seen that change. But COVID absolutely shook it up. It, it stimulated it like nothing else. And at one stage, I was just fielding inquiries about tree change and sea change the whole time. And the short answer, Pete, is I, I think that we will see an adaptation uh, in, in how we go about our working life, our, our time with our family. This will change us forever. It, it will be formative. But there'll also be a percentage of people who make the sea change and, and tree change and overlooking the benefits of living close to the city and, and that could be a, you know, more of a fad for them. I think we'll see a natural attrition of, of people who have made that decision and then retrospectively want to change it back and, and come back to the city. So, no, I don't see the demand for the regions being sustained at the same crazy level that it is right now. I mean, at, at the moment, Melbourne's not fun. There's no cafe culture and sporting and it's not a party city at all and everyone's a bit down in, in the dumps about that and we're seeing a lot of people saying I just want to get out of here but we will return to being a fun party city and we've got to remember all of the wonderful things about the regions but we also have to remember the wonderful things about the city so I, I think we'll definitely see a strong uptake but I don't think that it will be you know a crazy move of um, you know people all escaping the city there, there are some significant challenges to get your head around. And anyone that comes to me saying, I, I want to move away and I can do the commute, I say to them, try it before you buy it. So do the commute during work hours and do it consistently. Don't just do it for one day and say that it was a great train ride. Be on the train that is delayed or sits on the track or be on the platform when the services are cancelled because there's been an incident. Because it, it can really get to people. Oh, and yes. I, I, uh, when I was a trainee in London... Uh, doing my CA exams, I, I actually, I stayed living where I was in Essex and commuted into London because I said, oh, look, it's on the train line, I can do this. Effectively, the best part of two hours round trip, by the time you've added in the tube, the walk between the office and the tube, all the rest of it, uh, after three years, I was about ready to end. <laughs> I was absolutely, <laughs> and I, I basically said at that point, I'm never commuting again. Uh, I could justify it when I was... Uh, you know, 22 because I could use the train journey to revise for my exams which were pretty tough but I, I wouldn't do it now now I might do it one or two days a week that's a different question but to, to do it five days I you'd be amazed at how wearing it is because even if you leave work at a reasonable time you get home you, you're so exhausted all you can do is uh, grab a beer stick the telly on fall asleep and then before you know it you've got to <laughs> do it hour. all over again <laughs> yeah I, I think it's yeah I think it's one for people to consider quite carefully now I was reading a report a sneak preview of a report or a media release that's going out next week by a group called Riskwise Property Research and I should say they're not property bulls by any means I mean even the nature of their work is risk-based and actually a part yeah. of what they were saying was, was warning about um the outlook for CBD apartments, but it did say um, uh, it was a statistically sort of based view at the macro level, but it essentially said next year people will, uh, they've got access now to cheap money that they've never had before, people borrowing at two to three percent, plus yeah. we'll have the return of immigration, plus stock levels, as, you, as you've already shown us, are at extremely low levels, and in Melbourne as well, you might even get a discount potentially and what you might have paid maybe in January, February, depending on what you buy. And uh, the, the message, the conclusion was very clear. They said there's going to be a very strong performance, if not a boom next year. And now is the time to buy. Now, for a company that focuses on, first and foremost, the phrase I've said three times now, but principally focused on risk, uh, I thought that was a, quite a telling uh, conclusion. It did say people should be wary about buying rental units in some areas, especially some of the new stock, which got a bit sort of overbuilt in the high density areas. But it was certainly for people looking for homes or detached houses or stuff with a point of scarcity. They said, well, buy now. Is it Now, 
I guess the question for you, Kev, what, what do you expect to happen in Melbourne in 2021, given that mortgage rates are now available from 2% for home buyers and maybe a bit more for investors? It's a good question. And I'm trying very, very hard not to sprinkle fairy dust on <laughs> anything when I talk to people about what I think. I well, that's why, that. that's why I said, um, you know, you know risk-wise, if you read their, their mm. reports over, you know, the years, they've never, you know, they don't, they don't just uh, come out with, uh, you know, uh, fairy dust and roses. It's um, first, you know, firstly, what they do is actually identify risk. And then based on that, then they, they talk about opportunities. But um, mm. Yeah, I've never seen them come out with such a bullish statement before. So is that, yeah. is that what your expectation might be for next year? I, I think that for all of the reasons that you suggested, plus the fact that our building approvals are down, you know, developer finance is tough. Uh, we've got a few uh, things really pointing to a supply and demand imbalance brewing. And the cheap money is, is the, the real issue. The question about migration and when that will return is is probably the dark shadow that's kind of lurking in the background because if that's on hold for two years then that that will have a marked effect on our melbourne market the regions are probably a little um less um you know at risk because we we do tend to get the majority of our new arrivals coming into the city um, but i think that cheap money is is a key one to chat about and just as a a point to, to discuss and really understand, every time we have a 25 basis points cut now, it's a much larger proportion of what's remaining. You know, 20, it's not just um, a consistent reduction. Each reduction it has a compounding effect. And 25 basis points goes a long way now. The last cuts that we had, so we had the emergency cut to our rate when COVID struck and we had some consecutive rates before that, that series of rates in a short space of time, when I looked at, at the borrowing capacity for someone who could have borrowed 500000 before the rate cuts, um, translated into someone being able to borrow $580,000. Now, that's very significant. It's more than 10%. And it's 16%, if I got that right. Yeah. And no, if, anyway, I'll leave the maths to you. The point is when we see buyers out there in force putting their hands up at auction, it translates immediately. So every time we've had a rate cut and it's surged through, I know exactly how long the lending um, assessment cues are because you can see the, the bid strengthening as people are getting their hands on that pre-approval. It, yeah. it translates straight, straight out in the coal face. So I think that's what we have to fear. People are able to spend more and, and they've got a really powerful punch. Yeah, I suppose with the caveat, there's some industries like uh, tourism and hospitality, some parts of retail, uh, maybe for borrowers in some of those sectors may uh, mm. not see the full benefits of the borrowing capacity. But yeah, I think generally, and I think the RBA uh, research showed almost exactly what you said, and that's a permanent fall in the real interest rate has a very significant impact on housing prices, always has had. Uh, but also proportionately, the, the closer you get to the zero lower bound 25 basis points from 50 to 25 is not not the same as dropping from 10 to 9.75 it's proportionally a huge difference mm. and uh, yeah. accordingly it has a big impact on savers because nobody really wants to leave cash in the bank these days except as a buffer uh, so that that artificially or otherwise is going to put people into uh, property uh, stock markets and other risk-based assets um, mm. so Let's um, give us something a bit more Melbourne specific or, or Victoria for that matter. I'll put you on the spot a bit because when I come down to Melbourne, I mainly go to Crown Casino, the MCG, or we go for a pizza. I don't think I spend much time outside of those three locations <laughs> and maybe my hotel room. Uh, so I guess um, if you were a first time buyer looking in Melbourne, um, what types of areas and suburbs do you look at um, and maybe... What about for um, upgraders, um, people with, a, say, maybe a $1 million budget or above, uh, where, where would you look? And third question, is it different for investors, i.e., do you stick to, for example, transport links for investors and so on? So what kind of areas and specific suburbs might you look yeah. at? 
I try and remember all these questions. Again. <laughs> yeah, so if I, um, I, I should have written them down instead of just no, uh, firing them up. So. so question one, if you're a first time buyer, you're most likely going to be wanting to take advantage of any of the benefits that are on offer to you. So if you qualify for the stamp duty concession, you don't pay any stamp duty up to 600 and then you've got a sliding scale between 600 and 750. So you're probably, if you're playing your cards right, you're getting out of the way of the other grant holders who are capped at 600. And so those ones are, uh, we've got a couple of different initiatives. You've got Homes Vic, which is a shared equity scheme. We've also, um, we've, we've got some, some grants on offer as well. And so some of our first home buyers are absolutely capped at 600 and can't go over. If you're a first home buyer who's eligible for the stamp duty concession, probably pays to go a tad over because you're only paying a tad of stamp duty and you're getting out of the way of the others. So let's circle six to 650. If you're a first home buyer and it's all about being in a great spot, you'll probably want to be as close to the inner ring, the inner 10K radius as, as you can. And with that kind of budget, if you're in the eastern suburbs, you'll be looking at probably a two bedroom apartment. Now, if I was helping someone buy an apartment, I'd be avoiding anything that is brand new, anything that's high rise, anything with lifts, anything that has a potential for high owners corporation fees, thanks to high ticket maintenance items and special levies. And I'd be ideally going for a boutique property in really good order. It might be daggy and 70s in style inside, but if there's a small number in the block, it means that your ownership as a percentage of that block of land, equal and undivided share, is really attractive. And if it's in a great, quiet, leafy street, walking distance to shops, stations, bars, pubs, etc., then you're probably poised for some growth as well. So that would be a sensible apartment purchase in my view. A lot of people are steering clear of apartments though for, for lots of reasons. And that sort of budget, 6650, will also get you into a villa unit purchase, but you won't necessarily be looking in the inner ring if you're in the eastern suburbs or the southeastern. You'll be switching around to the north and the west. And in a north, inner west, that takes you through places like Brunswick, just touching on Coburg before you cross over Bell Street, which is a 10k radius mark. And then in the inner west, that's my heartland, so Yarraville, Seddon, Footscray. Uh, Newport, you'll get yourself a villa unit for that kind of dollars in the inner west as well. If you're wanting something more substantial, so let's say you need three bedrooms, you're looking at townhouses then, you will find yourself in the middle ring and potentially um, pushing to the edge of the middle ring in the north and the west. And if you're in the east, you'll be, or southeast, you'll be quite a fair way out. You'll probably be in excess of, of 20 kilometres to get a three bedroom townhouse, maybe even more. Now, if you're wanting a house, I'm not a house and land package gal. Um, that's a different topic for a different day. But if I was looking at established properties in established areas where train lines support, uh, you could look into the north and follow the high street trajectory through Preston and Reservoir. And when you cross over the ring road, you'll land into Tomstown and Laylaw. They're old 70s, 80s estates and they've got a lovely feel, great demographic, um, lots of 1950s migrants settled there. So you get lots of big concrete backyards and fruit trees and um, decked out garages with, you know, a second kitchen for posada and salamis and it's got a great flavour. So that's certainly somewhere that we've had on our radar. And then you can also... Look at the West if you're wanting to be as close to the CBD as possible with a 650 spend and a house on its own full block, you probably need to consider being about 15 or 16 kilometres west in areas like St Albans or Deer Park, which are still gentrifying, but they're changing dramatically and they're supported by train, although Deer Park's on a V-line train line. But that in a nutshell is first home buyers. And then you said upgraders. So if you're upgrading it's likely that you're wanting a bigger house. Not every upgrader upgrades into a, a family size property. They might be upgrading, you know, the quality of the dwelling or getting closer to town, but let's say it's a home buyer. If they're, spend, if they're wanting a three bedroom family home or a four bedroom, that seems to be the new normal. Everyone's added a, a bedroom since mm -hmm. COVID because they all want to study. Um, you, you're generally looking in the inner ring. You won't get any change out of, 1.3 and you'd, you'd really be pushing it at that level and 
if you're in the inner ring in the eastern suburbs, you'd be looking closer to two million dollars. But if someone said to me, I've got a million dollars to invest and I just want capital growth, I'd be obviously chatting to them about what sort of maintenance items they can deal with and um, and what what's driving the decision, whether it's the potential to uh, to do something to improve the property or to subdivide it, or whether it's just a, a passive investment. If it is the latter, I'd be looking at a really high quality area and then focusing on a dwelling that is very attractive and will we'll call it a tenant who uh, really cares about what they're living in and where they live and, and will take pride in it. And I would also be looking at things like orientation and floor plan because you, you can get that right first time. You can buy a daggy old property with the perfect floor plan and the perfect orientation. Very easy to do a cosmetic renovation. When you get a property that's nicely done, but it's got the wrong floor plan or the wrong orientation, it's a much more expensive fix. So they're the little tips and tricks that I'd be keeping top of mind if, if I was spending a million dollars in Melbourne. Thank you for a very uh, comprehensive answer, Kate. Uh, you actually preempted by an ultimate question, which was about units and apartments, because people often ask me, uh, are units a bad investment or apartments a bad investment? And they say, well, no. the answer is really, it depends. I mean, some yes. of my best, best investments I've ever made have been uh, units or flats, as we call them in England. But I'd say mainly they've been in mature capital cities where apartment living is normalised. Uh, so okay. places uh, like for me in Sydney's eastern suburbs or in London. Uh, they've also been, as you said, they're not off the plan purchases designed for investors only. And they're certainly not yeah. high body corps and, and that kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's generally speaking, well, I guess by and large, the type of place you would want to live in as a young professional. So uh, good locations, but also a point of scarcity and relatively boutique. Um, so, much so I guess we're coming up towards... Need to... Sorry. So you go. You um, go. People need to understand what it is they're looking for when they are wanting to invest because there's four things, there's four key metrics that, that you need to consider. It's not just capital growth. So the first one is growth, but the one that is really important, especially for someone who is cash flow sensitive, is the rental yield. Because there's no point buying something that delivers fabulous capital growth if the cost of holding it is so tough that you ultimately have to get rid of it. So capital growth, rental yield. The next one is rental vacancy rate. We can all talk about what the rent might be, but if there's a deluge of stock and you can't get the tenant and you've got a vacancy for four or five or 10 weeks, whatever it might be, that property is not giving you a return for that time and it hurts. And the last one is the quality of the tenant. And we talked before about gentrifying areas. I've got clients that love the idea of the gentrifying suburb until I give them a bit of a snapshot on what, what they might have to anticipate with their tenant selection and, and tenant management. And it's not for everyone. So it comes down to your appetite for a particular type of tenant journey and, and how much headspace you've got for the phone ringing. Because if, if you want to set and forget property with a perfect tenant, there are some areas you won't go into. Yeah, look, I, I think, uh, you know, I've done a lot of statistics and analysis over the years, but I, I can think when, when I think back to my journey, a lot of it wasn't much more sophisticated than looking at areas, well, would I want to live here? Could I rent this to somebody like me, you know, a young professional or professional couple, you know, amenities, all of that kind of thing. Um, I think sometimes in the gentrifying areas, just something to be wary of, I suppose, is if the tenant's are potentially different or difficult. You've just got to bear in mind whether you've got the stomach for it. So, okay, my final question for you today is an open-ended one uh, because I know I've put you on the spot a little bit today, but, uh, but just generally speaking, uh, do you have any advice you would like to give to people uh, regarding the Melbourne property market or uh, Victoria's regions for that matter? Just any pointers yeah. you would like to give or anything, any messages you would like to uh, get across? Yeah, I'll chat about both because uh, I, I think that there's merit in both. And the regions are doing really well at the moment. The regions are not meant to outperform Melbourne long term. And there are a few people that will disagree with me on that. But when we look at the rate of change that the regions are undergoing and the amount of work that's available, I, I had a look at, at some um, employment data that Simon Presley pulled together and um, it was nothing short of intriguing that Ballarat 
Bendigo, Geelong. They've got a lot of jobs going, a lot. And we're seeing that filtering through. So the regions can't be underestimated and particularly their, their rate of change at the moment. Advice for, for Melbourne property. I think that we're going to be in a, in a bit of a tentative environment for a while, even though there'll be really strong buyer energy. We'll also see lenders dragging the chain. We'll see very fussy lenders. We had a credit crisis about a year and a bit ago. And I, I think that credit is still not easy and any brokers would agree with me on that front. They're very selective, they're picky and choosy. They're looking at their risk. Uh, they're looking at, at what people's earnings are and what category of employment they're in and, and how reliable they are for their repayments. And so there's a lot of trepidation coming from our lenders. I would say get yourself a fantastic um, mortgage broker or advisor so that you know that you're good to get out there because if you can bid or buy unconditionally with confidence you're already in the box seat we're seeing a lot of agents converting auction campaigns to private sales in an effort to accommodate buyers who are very very nervous about unconditional offers and I know from my own experience that we've secured properties tens of thousands of dollars lower than a competing buyer because of our willingness to be unconditional. One was a $60,000 magnitude um, of differential, which is enormous when you think about it. That was a $1.1 million property. So we're talking more than 5% discount just because we were prepared to be unconditional when the vendor most wanted it. So finance is key. Um, when it comes to the regions, I've got some, some pretty pictures here. And, and I think you know, people need to be willing to think about what, what they're looking for in an investment and also be prepared to diversify a little bit. But I would say to anyone, if, if you've got uh, a, a figure in mind and what you're looking at it delivering you in Melbourne doesn't feel great, I mean, you need to be proud of it. You need to believe that you've nailed the growth drivers. If you can't get a great property in Melbourne in the, the, the type of dwelling that you're after, consider the regions. And this one's a good example. I had an interstate client, a guy in Adelaide who had, as you can see, had sub 800,000 to spend. And this three bedroom property with a little black dot there is exactly how close it is to the, to the water in Geelong. That tenant can now walk to the city, walk to the beach, walk to the parks. It's a beautiful property. And we've secured that for 768, 500 at auction. I just say, okay, this is gold. I've actually got a place on Gertrude Street in Geelong West. So please oh. give it a good spruke if you can. Oh, I love that street. <laughs> so I've bought on Gertrude myself. Super um, spot. You know, but as you said, if you're close to close to the water, it's the same yeah. the same ocean you get in the uh, the other capital cities. This is a, a beautiful, almost undiscovered little spot, and I've talked about it a few times in my blog. So I don't want people to think that I've got an interest in Rippleside other than I just think it's great. Um, one of my very closest friends did give me some money and said, I trust you completely, just get me something great. She gave me 650,000 and I bought a, a property in Rippleside with a, a north facing rear on a full block for them as well. And it, it was, you know, it, at the time it, it just felt like the right thing to do. The growth drivers were there and the money was right. Um, we can talk about other areas though, Victorian regions. We've got um, one here that I'm particularly proud of. And this property was secured for someone who did do the tree change move to Ballarat and is, is up there now working. And that, that's a house with a, a dual street frontage um, period style in a really nice part of Ballarat. Newington is, is one of the glossiest parkland type areas and Sturt Street is just above it. It's the, the horizontal yellow street and that's where the hospital and all the shops and everything are. So there's a lot to be said for our regions and your money can go a long way if you're willing to step outside of, of just thinking city centric. And I, I would argue that a house in a great part of any of our, our well-known regions will likely outperform an apartment in, in one of our inner Melbourne um, suburbs at the moment. Mm. So Okay, so I'm conscious of the time. We could talk property all day, uh, that's all what you day. actually do. But yeah. uh, I, uh, I don't think this is a difficult uh, question for you to answer, but if people want to know more about Cape Bakehouse and Cape Bakehouse property, uh, you, you're the only person who's on my screen more often than Eddie Maguire, so I don't <laughs> think it'll be very difficult. But uh, where, where should they go uh, to find out more? 
Well, my website's just my name, katebacos.com.au, and I put out a blog. I've also got a couple of um, podcasts going, and I've interviewed you on the Property Diaries, Pete. Um, I do share my information freely. I always think that, you know, if someone's keen to hear about it, I'm happy to chat about it. So, yes, there's, there's a wealth of information there, and click away and download away. Fantastic. Thanks, Kate. Now, I should say... Um, We've been thrilled to have Kate on because uh, Kate is also the president of Reba, the Real Estate Buyers Agency Association. Um, so Reba actually uh, promotes um, the the real estate buyers agents uh, sector, but also it's a, it's a standard of quality essentially for experienced buyers agents with its code of conduct. Um, now at Buyers Buyers, where uh, my business, we actually. Um, offer buyers agency services all around the country, not just in Melbourne and Victoria. Uh, but something we do a little bit different um, is yeah. we offer three different levels of service. So if, you, if you're a first home buyer, for example, and you don't have the budget um, to buy uh, or to pay for a full service from a buyer's agent, uh, we do have a, a cheaper negotiation, acquisition and due diligence products called We Buy. And it comes in at under five thousand uh, dollars. So we do have buyers agency services uh, using experienced and highly reputable buyers agents across all price points. We also offer the full service for people who are actually looking for that, which is most often suitable for investors. And we also have an auction bidding service called We Bid. So we've got services that cover the whole range all across the country and for every budget. So that's at buyersbuyers.com.au and Kate has already mentioned if you're a buyer in Melbourne or Victoria uh, she covers uh, Victoria's regions and Melbourne so I think we're just about done Kate so, so thank you for uh, joining today it's been a, a genuine uh, pleasure and also we've been thrilled to have uh, the president of Reba uh, just promoting uh, the good that um, people like your good self have done in the buyers agency sector over the years and uh, thank you for all of those insights that you've given us not just today but also across the media in general uh, just a wealth of knowledge and experience there so thank you thanks Pete it's um, been a total pleasure and an honor to be asked so yeah I'm really delighted thank you and hopefully at some point I'll open the state borders and we can go for a pizza yeah, I'd love that. <laughs> I'm missing all my buddies, that's for sure. Now, we've, uh, we've actually, I'll stop recording.